So I wanted to get this on file while I'm still thinking about it, still fresh in my mind, because this was probably the craziest day in Mets offseason history. And there's been some really crazy ones over in the, over the years. We've certainly seen a lot of insane trades, signings, uh, moves made. Um, this, however, was like something out of a movie or even maybe a video game. It's hard to say how this all compares to anything that we've ever experienced in real life, but let's try and break it down. As we all know now, Carlos Correa uh, recently uh, has announced that he's going to be signing uh, with the Mets, and this is an enormous move, not just for the Mets, but for really all of baseball, all of baseball now watching New York, and unlike any other situation in the past, or most situations, it's not the Yankees who are the ones making the move and have everybody's eyes you know, keenly attuned to them. It is now the New York Mets out of Flushing Queens who are now the focus of the baseball world. And you got to start from the beginning of this offseason. It has just been a series of just calculated additions and Steve Cohen really opening up the checkbook and saying, we are going to make a contender. And if I got to buy it to make it work, I'm going to do that. So you got to start from the beginning with uh, signing Edwin Diaz almost immediately to a five-year, $100 million deal. And that type of acquisition, uh, certainly a major addition to the team. Um, hard to really argue with that addition, uh, Diaz arguably the best closer in baseball all of last year. Um, maybe not even arguably. I think he was the best uh, reliever in all of baseball last year. Uh, so his addition, um, pretty much uh, there was no real expectation that he wasn't going to be signed. Um, really, it was just a question of if the Mets were going to be the ones who were going to be able to uh, put their hands on him first. And, of course, they did. And quickly, quickly, quickly uh, were able to uh, re-sign him uh, to that deal, and a worthy addition. I'm sorry, I, I, I said I think I said five years, 100 million. So it was actually three years, uh, 64 million with uh, two or, or th three options actually for 26, 27, 28. Uh, it's uh, 2026, 2027, and 2028. And those additions are uh, it, he's he's an enormous uh, addition right there. That, that's that in itself is probably enough for some teams uh, to acquire. Uh, Edwin Diaz would be enough. Um, Edwin Diaz is a elite closer. That's your that's your offseason right there. That is not enough for the Mets, because then of course we have the Degrom fiasco. Uh, w w probably go down as a, a, a terrible move by Degrom. I, I can't I cannot stress enough that he made the worst possible decision for his career. Um, Maybe I'll be proven wrong. I do not think so. Even if he's healthy, he's not going to be part of, I think, a winning team right there. It's it's really in a difficult place, and it, they won 68 games with the, the Rangers last year. Uh, but this is a team that's more in, like, year one of a rebuild, and they've certainly made some additions, and the Grimes the third major piece that they've acquired. Um I certainly hope some of their younger talent is going to make jumps, and we're starting to see that kind of pull into their pitching staff with DeGrom as now the ace, but uh, there are still a lot of pieces that are not really in place, and this is like, if they are going to build a contender, they're like two years away, maybe three even, and DeGrom's not getting any younger. This is kind of like, you, you if you bring in DeGrom, your expectation is to win and win very quickly. Um, I don't think they're really at that place yet. Um, maybe I'll be proven wrong. Um, we'll see. Uh, but I don't really know for sure about that. Uh, in lieu of resigning the ground, which was a, an enormous blow to Met fans uh, to not bring back the Grom, uh, it's it, it's a killer. It really is. Um, but they have they had to move on, and they did, and they moved on in the best possible way, which was bringing in Justin Verlander. On a two-year, $86 million deal, uh, includes a vesting option for 2025. Um, so it's, 
it's this is an incredible uh, addition. Uh, Verlander coming off of arguably the best year of his Hall of Fame career, and, the, and make no make no mistake, Justin Verlander, first ballot Hall of Famer, along Max Scherzer, and these two guys in tandem with each other for the first time since uh, the mid two thousand uh, mid twenty tens. Uh, when they were both in Detroit, um, having them both back in on the same team, wearing the same uniform, but instead it's now in a New York Mets uniform. It's nothing short of um, amazing, and it's really incredible uh, to watch uh, them uh, put the jersey on him in the press conference. It was an incredible moment. I, I really looked forward to it, uh, and I, I'm really hoping that uh, Verlander is, continues what has been an incredible career, second half of his career um, that he made with Houston, and I'm hoping it continues with his time in Flushing. It's gonna, and I think it will. Um, and so again, this again, most teams probably would have been satisfied with just the yes. Now you add Verlander to the mix, and you're like, okay, this is, you feel pretty good about this, right? Next up. They put together an eight-year, $162 million contract and re-sign Brandon Nemo when a lot of teams were looking at Nemo pretty hard because they knew Judge was going to fall to one of two teams, and so everybody knew Nemo was the next best outfielder on the market. And Nemo didn't have a ton of, uh, of great years prior to last year, but he has a very singular uh uh, traits in terms of the, what makes him very good at his job and it's his ability to get on base and honestly it's not just that if he was just like an on-base guy that was like you know Kevin Euclid's type guy who just gets on base guys who are good at that maybe, uh, maybe not Kevin Euclid's because Euclid's could do had a, had a good power bat good RBI guy uh, maybe like a Scott Hadberg really th- that type of guy if he was a guy who fit, fit in the Oakland A's money ball dynamic from like the early 2000s and certainly uh, Nemo is that type of guy. Um, I could see that being a guy who maybe not be worth like a ton of money, but Nemo does a lot of things really well. Um, he has good power. Um, he hasn't really flexed uh, like how good that power could really be. I think he's a 20, 20 25 home run guy. Uh, that's certainly depending on how healthy he can stay, and I think hopefully for the most part he will stay healthy for this for this the remainder of this contract. Uh, but he's also proven himself a good defensive player. This is this is somehow shocking. I, I don't realize, I did not realize that he would be as good in center field as he is. But he's really good. Not like a gold glover, but a guy who you feel very comfortable with in center field. Um, he's got terrific range, great closing speed. I think he's his metrics uh, for defensive save runs. I mean, he, he really. He really keeps himself everywhere, and does a fantastic job. So uh, we'll continue to see um, how how you know as as time goes by, how long he'll stay in center field. I think he will um, for the majority of the, of his run with the Mets, though. So uh, we we for the longest time have had a, a, a true center fielder, but Nimmo um, through really just kind of like desperation, they had to put, make him a good center fielder, and they did. Um, so uh, congratulations to Brandon Nimmo. He had a well-deserved contract, and we're, we're glad to see that he's going to stay in Flushing for the next few years. So, again, let's go back. Um, it's Edwin Diaz, Justin Verlander, Brandon Nimmo. And you think, okay, they spent 200 and – no, actually, sorry, $350 million. I think it's a, roughly about that. Um E three hundred forty, almost three, almost three hundred and fifty million dollars, right there. So three guys, you spent well over a quarter of a billion dollars, right there. And again, this is where most teams were like, okay, we've done, we've done what we need. Okay, now let's start making some trades. Let's get some like you know, uh, you know, like let's not break the bank for everybody. You know, that's not, not what, what we're supposed to be doing. Not Steve Cohen. Steve Cohen is like, let's do even more than that. Let's let's see how far we can go with this. So they go out and bring in. Guys, I did not realize we're gonna, I was going to like so much, but I was like, when I heard they announced them, these two additions, I was like, yes, these are exactly who we needed. So they go out and sign Jose Quintana, uh, the left-handed veteran starter um, who had come, was coming off a really, really good year uh, with St. Louis. Um, and his addition, uh, they bring him in on a two-year, $26 million deal. Uh, 
no options for that, but that's perfectly fine. I, I really like uh, Quintana. Uh, that's a really smart move. This is not like a budget move. That's like a really smart move. Um, Quintana's a really good starter. Um, you look at like what he did, which was he did not particularly he did not throw particularly deep. Um, in games, um, only 165 innings pitched over 32 innings. So he was definitely more of a, I'll give you five good innings. Um, they took him out pretty qu- pretty quickly once they got him through the first two times through the batting order. And depending on the situation, they were pretty comfortable with that. Uh, so we had that. But he, he did a wonderful job, particularly when he went over to St. Louis um, in midseason. He, was, he started the year on Pittsburgh and was surprisingly, like, Really and doing really well, and then came to St. Louis and just blew it away. Uh, three and two record over the next twelve starts. So he wasn't getting a lot of decisions, but two point oh one ERA, uh, forty eight Ks and sixty two and two thirds innings, uh, two point six FIP. So he was definitely getting it done and making very clear. Uh, but what I particularly really like was um, his limiting of home runs. Ended up leading the NL in home runs allowed per nine innings, uh, only zero point four. That's eight home runs. Only eight runs allowed over 165 innings pitch. That's a fantastic job. Um, he did a wonderful job and really cashed in nicely. So nice two-year deal for Jose Quintana. And that's a really good addition. Um, it provides them with a really good lefty in their starting rotation. That's a guy who can pitch. I feel very comfortable with pitching third in a, in a playoff series. Uh, he's got the stuff. I certainly think he can do it. The other addition uh, that they made was David Robertson. And... Veteran David Robertson, who has been in the league for God, how many years now? Since I believe it was uh, 2008, he first started with the Yankees, um, and then uh, there was the the matter of trying to bring him in to kind of replace Mariano when he was still with New York, and then was it found his way over to Chicago, the the White Sox South Side, and then came back to New York, um, working a little bit more of the setup role. And then kind of bouncing around, ends up on the Phillies, did not go well in 2019. He ended up getting uh, only pitching six and two thirds innings that year, um, and then went down and then uh, resurfaced in 2021 with the Rays. Uh, Rays pitching fairly well, but then a uh, real, real good comeback this year. It was a fantastic year, actually, for him if you look at his overall numbers. Um, split over 2022 with both the Chicago Cubs and the Philadelphia Phillies. Uh, finishes the year with a 2.40 ERA, uh, 81 Ks and 63 and two-thirds innings. I mean, the, the guy is just a consistent strikeout pitcher, a guy who he continually does everything. And even at this age, I still feel really comfortable with him in that setup role. So uh, his addition, wonderful. They sign him on a one-year $10 million deal, so uh, Robertson playing for some good money there, and definitely deserved it. And he finds himself in a great situation where he can just be the setup man to uh, Diaz and just pick up those holds. He'll do, I think, a wonderful job. And particularly with the other additions that they made, which was uh, trading for veteran left-handed reliever, Brooks Raley, and then also re-signing Adam Montevino. And now uh, those three guys... Are going to make up the interior of the bullpen. This is going to be you know, the, the prime innings, prime stuff. They have these three quality relievers. They're good guys uh, falling into Diaz. Um, and you also have, uh, Drew, uh, you still have Drew Smith there. Uh, Drew Smith still quality reliever. I, I think I, I was probably more, in, more on Drew Smith than other people, but he's a really good pitcher. Uh, and I, I think really highly of Drew Smith. Uh, so his addition, another one, and then uh, it's still 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 unclear what they're going to do about the, the rest of the bullpen. Um, but they may feel comfortable with just those guys going in. I feel like we, they should have probably another reliever in there, but we'll see. And then we have this. So again, they've done an enormous amount. We cannot even stress enough that this was a team that won 101 games and you feel super comfortable with them being a top tier team that's going to have great stuff going forward 
And even if they had not made all these additions, they would still probably be involved in the playoff pitcher. It was that good a team. Um, if they did not have Steve Cohen in, in place, though, if they did not have that type of, I can offer the money that you're looking for, if they didn't have that guy signing the checks and offering that kind of money, I don't know if they could make this kind of splash in the offseason. And this all leads up to, into today. Where obviously, the Mets were going to be the big winners of the offseason. It was already already settled. This was there was no question that they were unquestion. They were the clear clear winners of this offseason. And we're not even done yet. We were not even in January. Yet. Like this is still like a lot of offseason to go. Um, but they were leaps and bounds ahead of everybody else based on everything that they had done and everybody who they acquired. But to make this move is just mind-boggling. To make a, a middle-of-the-night, guess what, surprise, we actually are totally in on Carlos Correa. It's unbelievable. It's incredible. To bring in this guy, a multi-time all-star, a guy who is one of the faces of Major League Baseball, and there's no, there's no question, uh, Carl Correa, one of the biggest stars in Major League Baseball, right up there with Francisco Lindor, Mike Trout, uh, Aaron Judge, uh, you name it, Shohei Otani, all these guys, Correa right up there with all of them, and he is a spectacular two-way player. A guy who's willing to move out of his normal shortstop position and make no make no mistakes. Correa is not like this like broken down shortstop where you're like you gotta move him over to third base. He's not he doesn't have any legs. Like, Correa is 28 years old. He just turned 28. Um, he is as good a defensive shortstop as you're gonna find. A platinum award winner um, like Lintour is. It's it's unbelievable to have this high quality a player come to the Mets on a 12 year 350 million dollar deal dead of night move and it just kind of showed how interested in in Correa Cohen is that Scott Boris was able to kind of like finagle his way out of the signing with the San Francisco Giants over this dispute over uh a, a medical exam, a basically perfunctory move where apparently something came up with Correa's uh, examination that the Giants were not fully satisfied with, and you know that's their business. So, you know we'll find out exactly pretty soon as to what it was the actual cause of, of the Giants' you know skepti- skepticism about uh, his exam. We'll find out. Pretty soon, I would imagine, because if, if this deal gets okayed, which I, I don't see really any reason why it wouldn't be okayed, we'll see Correa um, coming in, and they'll be making some pretty clear, um, uh, cl- very clear uh, of assertions about what exactly was the reason why that Correa was so interested in coming to the Mets, and I, I think he really felt like it was a better chance to be on a contending team, uh, a team that was going to be able to win this year. Um, I think he very much desires a chance to return to October baseball and also to win a World Series again, which he has not done since 2017. Uh, so we'll be looking forward to seeing him in that kind of capacity. Uh, he makes the team uh, immeasurably better, and there was no question that this was a really good team, but their second half of that lineup – was a little little light on in terms of good uh, hitters. There is no question now. Carlos Correa's addition to this team makes him the most dangerous lineup in baseball. If you factor in, and we haven't even talked about, I completely forgot to mention uh, Omar Narvaez being acquired um, also during the off season and bringing in a catcher who's clearly just meant to be like more of a stepping stone to Francisco Alvarez. But this was a great addition. Um, I think a solid a solid guy. Um, he's going to fit. The, the need right now is they need an offensive-minded catcher. A uh, guy who's not particularly great defensively, but they have Tomas Nito still um, as the backup, and I think they'll go into that. There's still the question of what to do about James McCann. They're going to try and move him. 
we'll see how that goes. Uh, it's I, I feel very likely that they're going to just wave, end up waving McCann, but we'll see. Um, so factoring that in, you look at this lineup. You have Omar Narvaez behind the play, and eventually we assume Francisco Alvarez will be the guy who's going to you know, make his way up the chain and be the starting catcher. Would you factor in that you're like this is like Murr's row? Like if Alvarez is anywhere near as good as we assume he's going to be, and everybody assumes that Francisco Alvarez is a future all-star, a guy who you can like comfortably slide to the middle of your lineup, a guy you can f- reasonably figure is going to be a 25 to 30 home run threat um, minimum. Um, projecting that kind of imposing power hitter that's going to be behind the catcher, that's incredible. I mean, it's amazing. And you factor in that, that along with Pete Alonzo, Jeff McNeil, and remember, these guys, like, Alonzo just led the league in RBIs, finished the year 40 home runs, and then you have Jeff McNeil, the bad, the reigning batting champion. These are two guys who already, like, made up a really good lineup. Francisco Lindor had a great year last year, uh, didn't really get probably the recognition that I feel like he should have, but he had a fantastic year last year. I was really happy with Lindor. The guy who, who comes out of this probably the worst, uh, Eduardo Escobar, who unfortunately just, like, uh, if he had not, if he had not really kind of like hit the on switch at that last stretch of the season of the year, where he was like one of the few guys that was really hitting at the end of the year, um, without him, I don't know if like this lineup was would look quite the same. I mean, like well, you know, it looks okay with Escobar, you know, slotting in at third base. We'll see how that goes exactly, but they're in, they're intending right now is that he's going to be in the DH spot platooning with uh, Daniel Vogelback. That's a really good DH spot. I I really like uh, Vogelback and Escobar in that in that role, particularly Escobar's um, use as a switch hitter. So this has worked out really well with those two guys. Because uh, at some point we were like, okay, like they're going to bring in another DH, right? Well, no, we can just bring in another guy to replace your current third baseman and just move your current third baseman over to the DH spot. Great. All right, we're done. Uh, Mark Canha is probably the least imposing hitter in this lineup. That's like pretty, like, Canha's a really good hitter and does a lot of good, really good things. Didn't have a particularly great year last year, but um, still finished really strong. I, I, I liked what Canha brings to the team, and he's a solid guy. I feel, I feel very comfortable with him in there. Um, you, and you have Brandon Nemo, who had an excellent year last year, and Sterling Marte. And I, I'm really glad that, like, Sterling Marte, like, this is a guy who needs – this is a guy, they, without Starling Marte in the lineup, the lineup looked a lot worse in those periods of time when Marte was out due to issues. Unfortunately, he was out near the end of the year, which when they, when they really needed him. Um, the lineup was a lot less imposing when he, when he subtracted Marte. Now, um, there's no real danger of that. Now you got Marte in there, um, but also you have... Carlos Correa now. The, the, the Carlos Correa, if you factor him, he's probably going to be hitting fifth, I would assume. He'll slot in somewhere between Alonzo and McNeil. It's insane that McNeil's going to be the number six hitter, but that's how the way it's been drawn now. This is an incredible lineup. It's an incredible pitching staff. We've I just realized we completely forgot to mention... Uh, <laughs> We, we we completely forgot to mention. <laughs> I, I there's something wrong with me. I, I don't know how I blanked on Sanga. Like this is another. Like how did they forget him? Like how, like how did they not do this? Cody Sanga was the most coveted starter on the market behind Verlander and Rodon, and. He hasn't pitched an inning of Major League Baseball. Everybody's like super. Is everybody's totally in on saying that like this is a guy? You're like this guy's like a four starter. They still came out ahead. Like this is incredible stuff, and we'll just see how the durability lasts. But with him, but this is a fantastic job done this off season. I I don't know how they're going to possibly like add on more. Apparently, there's still stuff to do though. Apparently, Apple are still like we got more to do. Like. Their job isn't done. They're still going to be adding on poor guys. This is a payroll that's going to factor in over $380 million already. 
uh, and is going to be somewhere like a factoring arbitration cost is going to be about three hundred three hundred eighty million. But with the tax is that they're that's going to be level leveled at them. It's like another hundred million dollars. This is like a five hundred million dollar team. It's incredible to think that this is a team that has so much money invested for this one year, and you're like, this is the Mets. I'm still I'm still in kind of like a in like this whiplash mode where I'm, I'm still kind of like used to like the the Wilpons and their money like let's try to be as frugal as possible. We don't have money to spend. God, thank God we don't have to deal with this anymore, um, and we have. Steve Cohen in here doing what needs to be done to make a, a contender. And I, I'm so happy with it. I'm amazed how well it's gone. And it, it, we're doing an incredible job this year. I think it's going to be an amazing season. It would have to be, I mean, to, to, to fly up to these expectations, the team has to win like 120 games. But, you know, um, that's the way we've kind of, it's been kind of been played out. So uh, we'll see how it all goes. Uh, going forward, but I, I'm really happy with what we're doing so far, and uh, I hope what we're looking at is going to be a incredible year. Hopefully so. <laughs>